Good morning. The Lord be with you. Can I get kids to come forward with me up front and make sure you bring a palm branch with you if you don't have one? So welcome. My name is Stephen Sanders. I'm one of the pastors at Oak Hill. And this morning we begin our Palm Sunday worship outside. And the sprinkles are going to disappear in just a second, okay, by the time we're inside, all right? I'm going to let you know. Come on up, kids. I'm not that scary. I'm not, well, come on. I may be that scary. Come on up. Now bring your branches with you. Are there any... Uh, Adrian, would you like to come up here too? No? That's cool. All right. Now, wait, there's someone. Olivia, you want to come up? Can you bring your mom, Olivia? Come on, you can bring your mom. All right. Now, Matthew and Christopher, would y'all like to come up front too and bring a palm branch? Now, has anybody ever, who, what is Palm Sunday? Can anyone tell me what palm, yes ma'am, what girl? Ah, you want me to? You want me? Do you want? You want me to keep going? Okay. So Palm Sunday, it is a. That's what we're celebrating today. Almost two thousand years ago. That's a long time ago, wasn't it? Jesus came to a city called Jerusalem, and he came in, and there was a great big parade. Come on up! Come on up! And as P Jesus rode into town on a donkey, has anybody ever seen a donkey before? Yeah. yeah, have you ever ridden it? No. From Shrek, yes, from Shrek. Yeah. All right? And as people, as Jesus rode into town, people took palm branches and waved them. Take your palm branch and wave it. Everybody, wave your palm branch. And this part is kind of, all right? And some people took off their coats and they put them on the ground. And then people shouted together, Hosanna. Can you shout that with me? One, two, three, Hosanna. Shout it again, Hosanna. And then they said, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And then they said that word again, Hosanna in the highest. And so that's what we do on Palm Sunday. We remember the story of how Jesus came into Jerusalem and crowds waved what? Palm branches. And then they shouted, Hosanna. And so we're going to begin our worship time, and we're going to do that. We're going to have a parade, all right? And if you would like to help lead the parade, you can do that. All right, Abe? You can come in with me. And I'll let you know, we have two doors. Well, we have three sets of doors that lead inside. And then, guys, you may not believe this, we have four sets of doors that go into the sanctuary. All right? So choose any of those four sets of doors. All right? And if you would like to go put your palm branch down in front of the communion table, you can do that. If you would like to hold your palm branch during the rest of worship, you can wave it at times, or uh, my wife can even show you how to make a cross out of a palm leaf, all right? But we're gonna, we're gonna have a parade. And so this is our time of coming and shouting and celebrating together, all right? And everyone, we're gonna sing together Hosanna, loud Hosanna. If the words are on the screen, if you're watching online, and they're also in your bulletin um, on the inside cover. And so the choir is going to lead us in song, and we're going to have a parade. And wave your palm branches as you come in, and help make sure everyone makes it in the sanctuary, all right? Let's lift our voices to God. You want to?
right, I'm going to invite you to remain standing and to pray with me the opening prayer as we call on God's presence this morning. Let us pray. Holy One, God of goodness, we call out to you at the gates of righteousness, sometimes in praise, sometimes in distress, sometimes both at once. We long to be in your house in the presence of beloveds, binding the festal procession with branches. Open us this day to your love in and through the webs of our relationships and in the simple and good enough moments that fill our days. Amen. Now let's proclaim our faith for all to hear, lest the rocks be forced to cry out in our place. Join me in our responsive affirmation from Romans chapter 8. The words will be on the screen. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No. no. In all things we are more than conquerors through the one who loved us. We are sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Jesus orchestrated a low-budget parade in a city where he knew his days were numbered. Give me a colt, he said. Not a steed, not a float, a young green donkey. That's not the color. That's horse speak for not ridden a lot yet. And folks gathered, and his friends started some liturgical shouting that ticked off the local priests. Life is hard and we all need friends and sometimes big, loud praying that will not be messed with. We are created for interdependence. So all are hiding and pretending that we are perfectly fine, all on our own, just won't work. Get on the donkey when you need to and let people lay down their cloaks for you and make some noise for you because you know you'll do it for them too when the chips are down. So what keeps you from connectedness with others? Let us take a moment for silent reflection. Hear this compassionate word from the letter to the Philippians. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Know that already God is offering us freedom in, from isolation as we are called into the kind of community Christ had in mind for all. We are invited to the audacity of interdependence so that we might recognize love in its giving and receiving. And know that despite our sometimes faltering steps in the name of Jesus Christ, you are being forgiven. Even now, glory to God. Amen. All right, now you've had your rest. I'm going to get you to stand back up, and we're going to greet our neighbors with the peace of Christ. I'm going to invite you to make your way back to your seats, but remain standing and let us now lift our voices and sing, Tell Me the Stories of Jesus. Words are on the screen or on page 277 of your hymnals.
Good morning. Please join me in the prayer of illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our scripture today is from Mark 11, verses 1 through 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and we'll return it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied to a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying the colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. This is the word of God for the people of God. Will you pray with me? Gracious and eternal God, we pray that you open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit. Take our hands and use them, take our lips and move them, and take our hearts and set them afire with your unending love. Through Christ's most holy name we pray. And all God's people say, I know that it's Palm Sunday and all, and we began our time of worship with a parade, but I have to make a confession <clears throat> that I have not been in much of a mood for a Palm Sunday parade this week. There was another incident this week, this time in Nashville, another school, another, I'm going to spare you the details. Now, Nashville may like, seem like a million miles away for you, but I used to live there, and I lived right down the street from that church and school. And it just so happens that when my wife and I were a newly married couple, we went to a church, that same ch we went to a church just down the street from there. Th that church is pictured in those, in those images on the screen. You see, my, my best friend is the pastor at a church right down the street from the most recent incident. And all week he has been trying not only to help comfort his congregation and the community, but he's also found himself on national and international news programs. So you'll have to excuse me, Nashville is not a million miles away from me. It's on my heart. And as I've listened to the reports this week, all that I can say is, this is not the way the world is supposed to be. Amen? You may be able to say that about lots of things. About six weeks or so ago, there was an earthquake in Syria and Turkey that left over 50,000 dead. This is not the way that the world is supposed to be. My wife works at a domestic violence shelter, and I hear stories of moms and kids who, oh my God, I don't even want to think about it. The, we, we, have, we have real problems in the communities in which we lo live. Opioid and fentanyl um, uh, crises have, have racked us. And, and it seems, it just seems to me that instead of addressing the real world problems that we encounter, our elected leaders have decided to take us on sidetracks and turn us and pit us against one another. This is not the way that the world is supposed to be. And so, no offense, I have not been in the mood for a Palm Sunday parade, 
where people welcome Jesus as he comes into town. If you still have your palm branch, take it and wave it. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. That parade has felt incredibly irrelevant in my own life this week. Amen? But I decided that I needed to listen closely to this story, the story that we just heard read. And as I listen closely to this story, I realized that, that our world is not that much different from theirs. In this story, the, the, the people living in, in first century Judea, they lived in a, a Roman province, and they lived under Roman occupation. Now, Roman occupation brought lots of really good stuff. The Romans were really good at building roads to transport their military, but that led to economic prosperity for, all, for many people, especially at the top. The Romans brought culture and art and music and theater. The Romans did some really good stuff. They were also incredibly brutal. And the Romans perfected a form of torture that we would call the cross. And Romans used that form of torture, executing up to a thousand people a day on crosses as a way of maintaining military control, pushing down anyone who was thinking about rebelling. And so as the crowds greeted Jesus on that perverse Palm Sunday, they waved their palm branches, knowing that this was not the way that the world was supposed to be. And as Jesus came into town on a donkey, take your palm branches again, would you? We should have had you keep them, choir. You could have led us in this next year. They waved their palm branches and shouted. Shout it with me, guys. Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now, if you didn't know what the word Hosanna means, it would sound like it was a cheer, wouldn't it? What does it sound like? Hooray! Hip, hip, hooray! Jesus is coming! Yay! But if you know Hebrew at all, you know that is not what the word Hosanna means. The word Hosanna literally means, God, save us. Please. As Jesus rode into town, the crowd shouted, God, save us. Please, Hosanna, God, we need you to work in this world. God, save us from this brutal oppression under which we exist. Please. This is a personal question. Have you ever cried that out to God? When you hear about what is going on in the world, have you ever wanted to cry out to God? God, save us, please. God, save us from this violence that we commit against one another, please. God, save us from our divisiveness that is ripping us apart, please. God, save us from this mess that we have made, please. Anybody ever wanted to shout that? I have. I wanted to shout that this week. Now, if I were God, and we can all be very thankful that I am not, but if I were God, I know exactly what I would do. I would snap my divine fingers and make everything perfect. If I were God, I would send down the heavenly armies and whoop up on all of those people who hurt other people. That is what I would do if I were God, and we can all be very thankful I am not God. Apparently, God has decided to do something different. Jesus gets off his donkey, and he begins a journey. In the Christian faith, we... We claim, make a theological claim. We say that if we want to know what God looks like, we look at Jesus. 
because Jesus shows us what God is like. And what does Jesus do when he gets off the donkey? He begins his journey toward the cross. That's what he does. Jesus begins his journey toward the cross. Now, the cross is the symbol of the Christian faith. We have crosses everywhere. Take a look at a cross somewhere. Some of you have them on your neck. The choir has them on your stoles. We have crosses up front. We have crosses on banners. Crosses are everywhere. The cross is the central symbol of the Christian faith, and I'm going to let you in on a secret. It is a strange symbol for any religion to have. It is a strange symbol. The cross, my friends, it is a symbol of death. It's a symbol of destruction. The cross was a means of torture and public execution. The modern equivalent would be the hangman's noose or the electric chair. It's a strange symbol. But Christians make this incredible claim. We claim that God has done something through the cross. I need to do a little theology with you this morning, so bear, be with me. Be patient, okay? Take a look at the cross. Jesus begins his journey toward the cross. And I'm going to skip forward a little bit to Friday, all right? Good Friday. On Friday, we are going to gather here in this worship space, both in person and online. And we're going to gather in this space, and we are going to rehear the story of Jesus' public execution on Friday. It's a horrible story. And Christians have struggled with what to do with that story for almost 2,000 years. And there are all sorts of theologies of atonement that Christians have developed, but they all come down to this basic elemental thing, that through the cross, God has entered into the hurt and suffering of human life. God is not content to remain high and far removed from the pain and reality of human life. But through the cross, God has entered into the hurt and suffering and brokenness of the world. Now, if the story stopped there, the Christian faith would be hopeless, and it never would have gone anywhere. It would be simply realization that God enters into the hurt and suffering of human life. But you know that's not how the story ends, does it? And I'm going to skip ahead a little bit further, okay? I'm going to skip forward to this next Sunday. On Easter Sunday, next Sunday, right? Next Sunday, who's going to be here? We're all going to be here. Well, maybe not, but we're going to try Easter Sunday is one of the two highest celebrations in the Christian faith, the other being Christmas. And on Easter, we proclaim this incredible message that God did not let Jesus stay dead, that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And through the resurrection, God has proclaimed that sin and death and suffering do not have the upper hand. They are not stronger than God's love in Christ Jesus. Amen? That God raised Jesus from the dead. And that, my friends, is why the cross is the symbol of the Christian faith. The cross is the symbol of our faith because it proclaims, it proclaims a story that God so loves the world that God enters into the hurt and suffering of human life out of love. Yet God's love is also so strong that it does not allow suffering and death to have the upper hand. But God is at work in this world bringing forth new life, resurrection, that is the story that we proclaim as people of faith. And as people of faith, we are called to participate in God's work. Up on the screen this morning is one of the vows that is made that people make every time we baptize someone. And one of the things that we proclaim is that God gives us the freedom to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever form they present themselves. We are called to join with God in resisting evil, injustice, and oppression. But here's the deal. 
we don't do it the way we want to. We don't get just to snap our fingers and make everything better. We don't do it our way and call down our armies to whoop up on people who hurt others. As people of faith, we are called to follow the example of Jesus, offering ourselves in love, entering into the hurt and brokenness of human life, and trust that God saves, and trust that God can take our acts of love and mold them and shape them in God's divine hands and somehow work through that to bring forth new life, resurrection. And you may say to yourself, well, what can I do? What can me and my little life, what am, can I possibly do? I can't go out and change the world. Well, maybe you don't have to go out and change the whole world because it's not our job to save the world. That's God's job. Our job is to do our part. During this season of Lent, the weeks leading up to Easter, we've been reading a series of devotionals by Kate Bowler and Jessica Ritchie called Good Enough. And one of the things that Bowler and Ritchie do is they invite us into what they call a good enough faith. Now, by a good enough faith, they don't, they don't mean, eh, that's good enough. They invite us into a faith where small, seemingly insignificant acts done over time are good enough into a personal spiritual life where we do small things over time and God has used those to change our can use those to change our lives and they invite us into a spiritual faith a, a, a life of faith that does good enough things in the world offering ourselves in love in trust that God can use those to change the world Bowler and Ritchie invite us when there is someone we love who is hurting to show up. Not to go there and try to fix someone, not to try to explain to them why everything is turning out the way it is, simply to show up and love on someone. You see, they invite us into a good enough faith where we just offer ourselves in small ways. It could be after the ice storm. Remember the ice storm that hit us? And maybe you're the one person on your block that has a chainsaw. You can't go and take care of everyone's branches in Austin and Dripping Springs and Driftwood, but you can help the people on your block. A good enough faith is one, my friends, that engages in this world. Instead of just posting on Facebook about how mad you are on something, because posting on Facebook, I'm going to tell you, posting on Facebook is not going to change this world very much, except to make you matter. But to pick up the phone and call your elected leaders and speak to how your faith calls us to address the great social issues that we face as a nation. God can take those good enough, small little acts of love and use them and bring forth new life, resurrection. But it's not just us. It's not just us as individuals. You see, Jesus did not call us to live as individual Christians in this world. Jesus calls us to live together as a community of faith. And my friends, when we work together as a community of faith, God is able to take our small little acts and expand them. When there's a birth of a child or the death of a loved one in this congregation, as a church, we show up, not just as individuals, but as a community, and love on people and care for them. A good enough faith simply calls us to open our hearts and our arms to everyone, absolutely everyone God sends our way and letting them know that they are loved and cared for. A good enough faith is willing to go out on a Saturday afternoon, next, sat next Saturday, 
and hammer nails and paint boards to build a house for a woman. A good enough faith is one that opens its doors for a freeze night shelter or for AA or NA. And as we work together as a community of faith, God is able to take our small, seemingly insignificant acts and use them in greater ways. And my friends, we do not live here as a church, as an isolated faith community. We're part of a larger denomination called the United Methodist Church. And while I have a lot of problems with some of the things that, that we get all caught up in as a Methodist church, we are really good at working together. And as, a, and, as, and as a church, we are part of the larger body of Christ. And what can happen is people of faith, we can come together with our small acts and they can add up over time. You see, this congregation, we gave a few thousand dollars to help, to help in relief efforts from the, her, from, the, from the earthquake in Turkey and Syria. But, but other churches throughout the world, they have given their few thousand dollars. And I don't know if you know this, but when you multiply a few thousand dollars by a few tens of thousands of churches, it adds up to real money. And God uses that to touch people's lives. You see, one of the things that has happened over the last 2,000 years is that churches throughout the world have been able to come together and address the real issues that our world faces. Christians have worked together across, across this world, across denominations, to build hospitals, to open and operate orphanages and foster care systems, to feed people, to establish colleges and universities, to educate leaders. And if we as people of faith, as we as people of faith, are willing to engage in the, in the process of contacting and working with elected representatives and sharing how our faith calls us to address the great social issues of this world, not the pretend ones, the deep ones, God will use that to bring forth new life, resurrection. You see, as Christians, as people of faith, we live with a promise. We live with a promise that God, through the cross, has entered into the hurt and suffering of human life. And through the cross, God has overcome the power of sin and death. And I have to tell you, that gives me hope. It allows me to participate in a parade even when I'm not necessarily feeling up to it. But it reminds me that God is at work bringing forth new life. And when I'm willing to do my little part and offer myself in love, and you're willing to do your part, and you're willing to do your part, and you're willing to do your part, and you're willing to do part, and you're willing to do your part, God will work through that to bring forth new life and change this world. Amen? I invite you into a time of prayer. Most holy God, creator of all that is and ever will be, out of your goodness all things were made. But though you called them good, we found ways to mess them up and to bring corruption into your creation. And while we see glimpses of the beautiful in the natural world and the joy and laughter of children and lives lived well and acts of compassion and kindness and the like, we too often are met with the ugly realities of hate, of greed and illness and poverty, of injustice and hunger and war. Oh Lord, let not our mistakes and missteps overcome the good that you have placed within and around us. Help us to right the wrongs of our own making so that the restoration we crave in this world might come to be. For only you can bring about that kind of transformation. Exercise your control. 
For all things fall within your hands, and we need to be saved from ourselves. But don't let us off the hook too easy either. We need to be held to account, or we'll just continue to repeat our same mistakes. Let the consequences of our actions as well as our inactions weigh on us. That we would learn to make new and better choices. Help us to stand against the forces of evil and oppression in this world and be not afraid to lift our voices against injustices in whatever forms they take. For the rocks around us stand ready to cry out should we fail to do so ourselves. As our nation reels from yet another school shooting where the lives of the young and innocent were ended far too soon, we ask, Lord, for your peace to surround the families whose lives have been devastated. We ask for your help in addressing a mental health crisis that has spiraled well beyond our control. We ask for you to stir our nation's leaders into action to bring reformation to the laws that are meant to govern and protect us, especially the most vulnerable, that our schools and our places of worship and our streets would feel safe again. O Lord, hear our prayers, for it's from a place of desperation that we raise them up to you, knowing the limits of our capabilities, but trusting that nothing, nothing is impossible for you. We also lift up to you this morning Barbara McVeigh, Jimmy Dunks, Joan Cox, Mary McNally, Carol Hartman, Dora Alcala, Larry Wilson, Corby Barho, Carrie DeYoung, and all who mourn. We pray that you know their needs. We pray that you know our needs, that you would know the needs of those still on our hearts this morning. And meet us all with your grace as we pray the words that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Serving others is a good way to make a difference in the lives of those around us while putting our faith into action. But while we're making an impact on the lives of others, God is also making an impact in ours too. Here to share with you about participating in the Supper Club feeding ministry at Garden Terrace has meant uh, what it's meant to her and her daughters is Amy Lohr and Ellen and Cora. Hi, um, I am Amy and along with my husband and Ellen and Cora, we have been members of Oak Hill UMC since 2017. We've been involved in several ministries, including Children's Sunday School, Family Faith, and Women of Valor. All of these have meant a lot to our family in shaping our faith and our outlook on life. It's important to David and me to share uh, the love and care that we feel in this church with the community. That is why the girls and I were excited to participate in the Supper Club ministry at Garden Terrace. Garden Terrace is a foundation communities facility that provides affordable permanent housing and wraparound services to adults who have been <clears throat> or are in danger of experiencing homelessness. Some of the residents who live in Garden Terrace are short term, while most are more permanent as they are on fixed incomes, have experienced limiting injuries or in declining health. Garden Terrace provides them with comfortable living accommodations, but not all of them are able to cook meals from scratch. And that's where we come in around quarterly, thanks to the coordination provided by the church and currently Christina Hall, we can feed more than 90 residents each time we go to Garden Terrace. 
After we prepare the meals in our homes, we go to Garden Terrace and serve the residents, and then we eat with them before cleaning up. What's also wonderful is I've shared this opportunity to share to serve others with my girls, and it's so rewarding to see them directly help the Garden Terrace community. So I'd like them to share their perspectives too. Hi, my name is Ellen, like my mom said, and um, this is why you should volunteer at Foundation Communities. That I was, the Foundation Communities help people who are transitioning or were in danger of being homeless. I really like to serve either the main meal or the first course when we're um, in like a line, like in that picture, giving people the food. Um, and one of my favorite times at Foundation Communi Communities was after we served the food, someone came up to us and saying to everyone, and that was really fun. And another thing I really enjoy is talking to people that I normally wouldn't talk to at school or at home. If you like cooking or serving other people, you would really enjoy this. I'm always looking forward to going to Foundation Communities. I hope to see you there. Hi, everybody. I'm Cora, and I love going to Foundation Communities because I just love all the people there, and they're all so nice, and I enjoy talking to the people who are there. Foundation Communities helps people who just got out of homelessness or have like an like injury. an injury injuries, and I hope to see you at the next one. <laughs> Guys, that was awesome. I'm proud of you. Thank you. As a church, we commit to be in mission and ministry. That is why we exist. We exist as a church to be transforming lives with the love of God and with the love of one another. And whether it is providing meals and sitting down and visiting with people and recognizing our shared humanity, or it's building a house, or it's caring for kids, that is how this church is, is joining with God in God's work of redeeming creation. And my friends, your generosity helps make that happen. Your generosity is a spiritual practice. When we offer a part of our resources to God, we are making a sacrifice. It is money that we could have used in a different way. It's a sacrifice but it's also a holy sacrifice because there is good. As I, as you, as we give a portion of the blessings in our lives and sacrifice a little bit, God is able to use that to transform lives and somehow, somehow it also transforms ours. Over the last few weeks, we've been sharing with you our narrative spending plan. If you haven't gotten one of those, it's a, it's a simple brochure that has a bunch of pictures and explanation of our ministries. If you haven't gotten one of those, if you just raise a hand and an usher will bring that to you. This is the last Sunday that I'm lifting this up, by the way. And then this week, my wife and I are turning in our pledge card, our commitment card. And if you're a part of Oak Hill, I, I hope you received one of those in the mail. If you didn't, we've got them out in the foyer area. And I invite you to join with my wife and me in giving of your gifts to God. And if you're willing to, make, uh, make a commitment to do that for the year. Because I don't know about you, but committing to do something actually helps me do a better job of actually doing it. But I also invite you to simply give out of love for what God has done and out of a desire to be the hands and feet of Christ. In just a moment, our usher is going to come forward, and we're going to receive an offering. And I invite you to give in one of three ways. You may want to give electronically. You can go to our website, or you can give by texting, and that will, uh, that will um, allow an opportunity for you to give. You may also be one of those people who prefers to put something in an offering plate. And so we have baskets that are going to come forward, and we invite you to give that way. But I invite you, even if you have already given electronically, touch the basket as it comes by, and remember, remember that you have given. Remember that you are part of the ministry of this church. And also, if you would, to do me a favor and drop your prayer and registration card into the basket as part of your own offerings to God. And then after you give your offering today, you're going to receive something. 
everyone is going to receive two little cards, and they have our Holy Week schedule on it. And so I'm going to ask a second set of, of ushers to pass out two to everyone, including kids. And any leftovers, bring them up, and we're going to throw them at the choir at the end. All right? Now I invite you to listen as the choir lifts their voices, and I thank you for your generosity. God uses it to change this world. I invite you to be seated. If you're in the sanctuary, if you would take the two cards that you received and hold them in one hand. If you're worshiping with us online, we'll try to get you a copy of this, but just n pretend like you're holding it. And here's what I want you to do. Hold your cards. I can see if you're doing it or not. We didn't get them to you, choir, did we? Pretend. These are not for you. You can take one of them, of the two, and post it on your fridge. But the other one's not for you. It's an invitation. It is a tool for you to invite someone to be 
part of Holy Week, particularly Easter worship. And so take it, hold it in one hand, and put your other hand on top, and pray with me. Holy God, you are moving and stirring in this world. Through Christ, you have entered into this world to dwell among us and bring forth new life, resurrection. And your spirit continues to serve and stir. Pray, we pray, O oh God, that you stir within our hearts. Place upon our hearts the name or face of one person that you would like for us to invite to hear the good news of your love, to celebrate the power of your life-giving spirit. And give us the courage, O oh God, to invite another that you might stir in their lives. We lift our prayers through Christ's most holy name. And all God's people say, one of the ways that God stirs through our lives is through this meal that we call Holy Communion. It's a meal that Jesus instituted on his last night with his disciples. We have been called to be instruments of love and grace in this world. And I don't know if you've ever noticed that, but it can get tiring. So God calls us to recharge our souls and to nourish ourselves that we might have the energy to offer ourselves in love. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and who seek to live in peace with God and with one another. I invite you to join with me as we pray a blessing over these elements using the words called the Great Thanksgiving, and we're going to be singing that together this morning. So even if you don't know the words, I invite you to say them when we begin singing them together. The words will be on the screen. Let us pray. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give you thanks, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed each of us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life, even when we turned as individuals, as the world, as we turn from you, your love did not turn from us. And you have reached out and drawn us with the offer of bright life with you, O God. And so with you and your people of, on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, as he gathered at the Passover feast, he took a loaf of bread. After giving thanks, he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, Jesus took a cup, after giving thanks, he blessed it and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. 
Christ has died. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon each of us gathered here, both in person and online, and upon the gifts of bread and cup that we have before us. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Worshiping online, if you would take your bread and lift it and break it with me. The body of Christ, broken in love for you. And then take your cup and lift it. The blood of Christ, the cup of the new covenant, given for you. I invite those who are helping serve communion, if you would come forward. And as they come to distribute the communion elements, I invite you all to come and receive. In the United Methodist tradition, we practice what we call an open table. We believe that God's love and therefore this table is open to all. And all means all and that's all. We invite you, if you're in the sanctuary, to come one of three ways either through the center aisle or along the far right wall by the windows. Come with your hands and your hearts open. One of the servers will break off a piece of bread and place it into the palm of your hands. We ask that you take it and then dip it lightly into the cup and consume that. If you would like to receive gluten-free crackers, we have separate gluten-free crackers and a separate cup that are available, and those will be in the center on the right side and simply come to the server for that. We also have individually wrapped cups if you prefer. If you're worshiping with us online, take time and receive communion wherever you are and enjoy the music as it plays. And then after you've received, spend a little bit of time in prayer. We have kneelers up front. You may want to come back and just sit in your chair and in, in your pew and just spend a little bit of time opening your own heart to God. My friends, God, Christ, has given us this gift of communion because it can get tiring in this world. And if we're not careful, we will get worn down. Communion is a way of opening our hearts to God allowing God to fill our souls. This table's ready, and it's open to you. We invite the ushers to come. Grown-ups, help your kids. Kids, help your grown-ups. Come. The table's ready.
them, simply raise your hands and one of us will come. Will you join with me in our prayer after receiving the words are printed on the screen? Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. My friends, this morning you've been fed. You've been fed with music, you have been fed with community, you have been fed with bread. Now, go into this world in a few moments to feed others, to love people where they are, to care for people in this broken world, and God will use that to change the world. We invite kids and their grown-ups to come up after worship and take any of the leftover communion bread and help us scatter it. You may eat it yourself, you may share it, and you may take it and simply scatter it around this campus. But sharing the love of God with the world is what you're doing. And I invite you this week, wherever you are in your own spiritual journey, to take a new step. If you're at a point in your journey where you are ready to affirm or reaffirm your own life with God in Christ, I invite you to do that. You can do that where you stand as we sing our final song, or you can spend a time up at the communion kneelers um, having an additional time of prayer. And if you're ready to become part of, of Oak Hill and live out your faith with us in this community, I invite you, if you're online, to visit with Pastor Missy. If you're in the sanctuary, come see Pastor Ryan or me as we sing, or meet any of us outside, and we will visit with you. And this week, be intentional. In some way, offer yourself in love. Follow the way of Christ. Offer yourself in love to this world and trust that God will use that to bring forth something new, resurrection. I invite you to stand with me as you are able and let us lift our voices as we make a turn toward the cross on Friday. As we sing together, what wondrous love is this? We'll sing the first, third, and fourth verses. The words are on the screen and also on page 292 in your hymnal. Let us lift our voices to God.
Today is the beginning of Holy Week, but we have a lot more heading your way that you need to know about. So here's what to look for. And be sure to join us for what you can and invite your friends and neighbors along too. Starting Thursday evening after dinner, we would like to invite you to try out the spiritual discipline of fasting. Choose something that works for you, whether it's food, phones, TV, or something else, and fast with us through Friday and into the early hours of Saturday morning. On Friday, join us for a meaningful Good Friday worship service here in the sanctuary at 6.30 p.m., where we'll remember the events surrounding Jesus' crucifixion and death. Then remember our fast. On Saturday morning at 8.30, we're going to gather in the fellowship hall to break the fast with a celebration of Holy Communion and a potluck feast. And be sure to bring your Easter baskets because right after the, we break the fast, we'll have our Easter egg hunts starting at 9.30 a.m. over at the Children's Building. We've got lots of eggs to find with lots of delicious candy inside, and we'll have different egg hunts for different age kids. And then next Sunday, it's Easter. All you early risers, join our youth and Methodist men at our sunrise service in the courtyard at 7 a.m. as they lead us in worship and celebration of the empty tomb and Jesus' resurrection. We'll also have our regular worship times at 8.30 a.m. and 11 here in the sanctuary. So, don't, or, so join us as we uh, sing our alleluias and give praise to the risen Lord uh, whose resurrection changed everything. Whew. All right, made it through. It's going to be a busy week, but it's full of good stuff, so I hope you can join us. And now receive this blessing for when you feel lonely that comes from Bowler in Richie's book. Blessed are we who cry out, God, I need a friend to share the simple, unaffected joys that come, the troubles unbidden, those too heavy to sustain. Blessed are we opening our hands in readiness to risk intimacy, to receive the gift of friendship and give it in return. We are blessed. Go in peace. Amen.